our speaker. Alice, I'll let you take it. Happy to introduce uh, Janet Thompson, our Northern District Commissioner. Um, Janet uh, is an attorney, I think all of us know, and she got her degrees at MU, as well as in 2002, a master's in alternative dispute resolution. Uh, Janet's a pretty active lady. I saw she was on a board of a slew, including the Board of Health, of um, organizations, in addition to her responsibilities with the commission. Um, let me see. I think the only other thing I need to say is that Janet likes horses. Um, thank you, Janet. Oh, she was with the Public Defender's Office um, for many years, 25 years. Thank you, Janet, for being here today. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. It, it's, uh, a, um, as I was thinking about this upward mobility grant, it really is an opportunity for Boone County. And so just to sort of set the frame a little bit, how we got started on this process. I participated in a meeting through the National Association of Counties, NACO, last summer about the economic impact of COVID-19. And, it, and I, I won't forget the, the meeting because I was on the road, I, I shouldn't say this because it's, but I was, I was on the road between um, here in Kansas City during this entire meeting. And um, it was eight counties significantly that were invited to participate. And we were talking about the, as I say, the economic impact of COVID-19 on our particular communities. And the reason we were drawn together was uh, NACO and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was um, involved in preparing a white paper about the economic impact across the country of, of the of the pandemic on all of these communities. So based on that, I think that probably had at least brought Boone County a little bit into the eyesight of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But early last fall, a contact at NACO reached out to me and, and asked if we wanted to apply for this grant from the Urban Institute. And it was a very, very short time frame. But um, luckily, nobody does call screening when I call them. And they all said, yes, we'll participate. And we, we were able to get our initial application in. The leaders in that very early process were the members of our Boone County Community Services. Joanne Nelson is our director. And, um, and we have a data analyst in that department as well. And we knew that we needed to be have Boone County Families or Community Services in the mix because this had to be county driven. It, that was part of the application. Cradle to Career Alliance was one of the early folks that was involved. Ready was a part of it. The Columbia Housing Authority, Central Missouri Community Action, including the Women's Business Center and the Minority Men's Network. Later additions and huge partners have included the Worley Street Roundtable and MU Healthcare. We made the first cut and then we had to step up our game even more because there were very particular questions that were being asked about our community and about um, our dedication to this project and to, and to the, the principles involved. And what struck me when I first read the pieces that were coming in from the various um, participants in creating that application was one sentence that was penned my, by my friend and colleague, Darren Priest, the executive director of Central Missouri Community Action. And he said, despite, and I have to read this to you because it's just pretty stunning. Despite many economic advantages in Boone County, Missouri, economic mobility is abysmal. That pretty much says it. I think that that very brutal honesty about who we are and our commitment to transformative change was one, why we were one of eight counties chosen to be part of the initial cohort for this grant. We found out in December of last year that Boone County was one of the final eight, was part of this cohort. And we are the smallest, but I think the mightiest of the group. 
The others are Alameda County in California, Philadelphia, Ramsey County, Minnesota, Riverside County, California, San Lucie County in Florida, Summit County, Ohio, and Washington, DC. So big hitters, heavy hitters in, in the whole process. Again, um, to look at our application and going forward, I think one of the big reasons we were also chosen is, is that we are a data-driven community. And in preparation for talking to you today, I looked back at our application and it really does hone in on what we do in, in this community and how we look at problems. We are data-driven. Uh, for instance, as uh, on the county side, we are part of the data-driven justice initiative. And that's a, an initiative that began in the Obama White House and then moved to the Arnold Foundation. We led a data-driven initiative with the Pritzker Family Foundation in partnership with Cradle to Career Alliance after we were chosen as part of the initial cohort for their prenatal to three grant. And for that, we used our GIS mapping of home visiting service recipients of Medicaid utilization rates of birth outcomes data to look at how, um, how we could create a plan for home visitation that would improve outcomes for kids across our community. We've also aligned our community's major funders as members of the Boone Impact Group. And I think Carl's well aware of this because of the city's involvement because now we use a collective impact approach to utilize same measures for common outcomes so that we prevent duplication of effort and we ensure funding is equitably distributed. So we are a data-driven community. And I think, again, that's a piece of why we were chosen for this award. Since the award, meetings have been held at least every two weeks working through what metrics will be used to drive change and also how the data will be gathered so that our community's responses will be based on community data. And what the, in each of those meetings, what they've been working through is what they're calling a mobility met, metrics framework. And you look at that and you go mobility metrics framework, what on earth does that mean? So what they're looking at is the notion that local conditions profoundly shape the opportunities for people to achieve mobility from poverty. And mobility metrics as established by the Urban Institute reflect that framework for local action. In those metrics, they identify three interconnected dimensions of mobility, three key drivers, and then 25 evidence-based predictors of mobility from poverty. Their framework begins with a three-part definition of mobility from poverty. The U.S. Partnership on Mobility from Poverty states that meaningful and sustainable mobility from poverty encompasses three dimensions. The first is something that I think, you know, when you start thinking about it, it's pretty self-evident, economic success, right? An economic success under their definition means that rising income and assets are critical and those obviously are widely recognized as essential from this mobility. The second is power and autonomy because mobility upward requires that you have control over your life and that you have the ability to make choices and you have the collective capacity to influence larger policies and actions that affect your your future. The third dimension is that you are valued within the community, that you feel the respect and dignity and sense of belonging that come from contributing to your community. And that's an essential element of this mobility from poverty. And, and as I thought about that, um, the, the person's voice in my head that really came to, to really resonate was that of Steve Calloway. Because when we were putting together this whole process, Steve said, remember, 
this for this to be successful for this to have the impact we want it to have we can't have some over you know overarching group some umbrella organization acting on or acting for the people who are want are supposed to be impact this can't be a top down this has to be this has to involve and engage the people who who are are to be impacted and so he said remember that no matter what that whether you're looking at an um, an economic divide, a racial divide, whatever, don't think that you're going to act from the top down. So that, so it's Steve Calloway is in my head whenever I think of, of this project. So again, when we think three-part definition of mobility, economic success, power and autonomy, and sense of being valued within the community. This um, US Partnership on Mobility from Poverty also talks about three key drivers that propel individuals and families up and out of poverty over the course of their lives. And each, and each of the three contribute to that economic success, to that power and autonomy, autonomy, and to the sense of belonging and value to the community. And those three drivers are first, strong and healthy families because a secure and stable home environment provides the essential foundation for healthy development of kids and from their educational and economic success of kids, of adolescents and of adults. The second, so strong and healthy families, second, supportive communities, safe and inclusive communities play a central role, right? In shaping their families and their well-being. The third is opportunities to learn and to earn. And when you think learning, and this is a piece of why we're involved with Cradle to Career Alliance, education is critical pre-K through post-secondary, as well as adult ed and workforce development. And then work is obviously the most important means of economic security and advancement. So as we've moved through this process with this, um, with these every two weeks meetings, we've looked at the strong and family health, um, strong and healthy families driver. A piece of that has looked at financial well-being, which they're, they're defining as income and financial security. So that's a component of what we're looking at. Housing is a component of what we're looking at in this project. Affordable housing, housing insecurity, homelessness. How are those defined? Who is impacted by those questions? Family, um, family structure, family stability are other pieces of data that are being collected. Um, health, overall health. Is, is critical, but access to and utilization of health services is critical, as well as neonatal health services. The supportive communities driver includes local governance. When you think about that, you know, what is the political participation of the subject groups? Does, does government look like the people that, they're, that it's serving? Does local government especially look like the people that it's serving? Neighborhoods are critical for, for supportive communities. Is there economic inclusion? Is there racial diversity? Is there a sense of belongingness? Do the groups that we're looking at have social capital? Do they have transportation access? Are there issues of environmental quality involved? Are there safety issues in neighborhoods? What is the exposure to trauma? What is the exposure to crime? Um, on the law side, are there overly punitive policing policies? And then for the opportunities to learn and earn driver, education is critical, 
And this is part of why um, CMCA is so important in this discussion, access to preschool. And if you start thinking about some of the other things that we've been working on, uh, the ARPA funding looks as though there may be some, um, some possibilities across the country of that money being utilized for early childhood education um, projects. So access to preschool, effective public education, student poverty concentration, college readiness, again, why um, Cradle to Career Alliance is, is involved, and then work, employment itself, and access to jobs with living wages. What are what is a living wage? Because that also impacts that mobility, that economic mobility piece. So metrics are what we've been involved in in the last, gosh, six months or so in all of those meetings, figuring out what the metrics are, looking at who will be involved in implementing um, this process. And this meeting today is timely because next Wednesday at the atrium, they are planning the upward mobility kickoff event. And I think Carl, um, you were invited. I hope you'll be able to attend. Um, that, that event is to formally begin the work of creating the action plan to improve economic mobility throughout the county and community stakeholders are being invited to come together to begin that process of setting priorities and then to engage in strategic action planning. Because of the work that's involved, um, they, are, they are doing this not remotely. They're not even doing um, a remote option. It's, it's live and in person at the atrium. Um, and just FYI, if, you, if you're interested if, and, and you want to attend, you can contact our um, contact me and I'll forward the information to Megan Corbin Banya over in community services to see if there's any space left. But that begins the process of what they're calling a data walk. And what's going to happen across the community, there are um, organizations like the Worley Street Roundtable who will bring all of these issues to people in neighborhoods that are, are at issue, have, have economic mobility issues that we know about and start that data walk to, to collect data from the individuals in the neighborhoods. So that's going to be happening um, as we move forward with guidance from the um, from the Urban Institute. And as I say, next Wednesday is the is the kickoff for this event. So that's the overview for what we're doing. And I figured um, overview gives us time to to talk about it, to to think about what what this looks like for Boone County. Um, to me, this is a huge opportunity. It meshes well with everything that is happening in um, with ready when I went to ready at the get-go and said will you help they said you know this this aligns with all of our work to um, to really engage sectors of our of our population that have not been engaged before uh, it is it aligns with what's been happening at um, Central Missouri Community Action, especially with the Women's Business Center. It aligns with much of the work done even with Dan Hanneken and Into Action for folks who are coming back into our community as um, in the reentry field. So it, it really aligns with much work that had already been begun in here in Boone County. And it gives us the opportunity to do this in a mindful way with guidance from people who do this all the time. So I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, it is, yes, it is August 11th. Did I say, I think it's not, oh, I'm sorry. It's not next week. Oops. I've, I'm a, I'm a week behind. I'm a week ahead of myself. 
I see a, a note from Steve. It is August the 11th and it be, it's from nine to 11. So Steve, you are right. Janet, when I originally read about this, it really impressed me the other counties that received the grant. Do you yeah. do you remember any of them? Well, it, it is it's an it is an impressive group. As I said, it's um, we are tiny compared to the other communities that were that were chosen. Um, you know, and and it speaks it speaks volumes, I think, for um, for this community and the people who came together initially to to write the grant, you know, the the response to the um, RFP, because it was people like um, Darren Priest and Jesse Yankee from Central Missouri Community Action who who spoke um, about their activities and what they are doing already in CMCA to promote upward economic mobility. And they have, they are very aware. And, I, and as I um, spoke initially, you know, um, Darren's analysis of our community as um, abysmal, the level of, of economic mobility being abysmal. I mean, that, that word has so much power to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, it's, it's that kind of, um, self-awareness and the activity that's already going on that really uh, got us towards the front of the pack for being one of those eight counties. Because um, it, it took, it, it was a lot of effort. There were a, ton, there were a lot of counties that applied and, you know, um, Washington, DC, Philadelphia, Alameda, Riverside, Ramsey, Summit and St. Lucie, um, and then there's Little Boone County. <laughs> but you know, but it really, I mean, it does. It's it it's it's impressive, but it also says um, we we need to step up and make this work and use this opportunity with the Urban Institute with their guidance because we've got 18 months of technical assistance from them to create that plan of action and. And this is hard work. This is working through and seeing what the data shows and then creating that action plan to say, where do we go now? What do we do now? So when will the action plan be formulated? Well, I, that's what they're, that's what's starting now. That's what yeah. will be starting now. And, and thank you to, to Steve Callaway for saying, oh gosh, um, it isn't on, it isn't next week. Cause I'm, I'm looking, I, I'm looking at my, um, my August calendar and I'm thinking, oh, it's next week. No, it's, it's the week after it's August 11th. So it's Wednesday, August the 11th that this happens, but, um, it is, um, that's the beginning of that. That'll start the, um, the whole process of doing the data walk and the really hard work of, of collecting the data and making sure that we have a plan in place that then can be effectuated to, to create that general it's, we're looking at something that is for generational change, right? It's kind of like, um, and, and Mari, just a second, I'll get to you. Um, it's kind of like, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I attended virtually the NACO annual meeting and Speaker Pelosi spoke about um, what is intended for the, the ARPA funds. And she said, you know, it's not to be incremental change. It's to be for transformative change. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the same opportunity. This is something that we need to make that transformative change in systems that you know that create barriers to upward economic mobility. So that's what I'm hoping that you know that we we put ourselves on that path. Mari, you had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the, all the effort that you're putting into starting this process. Um, I've been aware of the data about the lack of mobility between generations in our community. <clears throat> especially in among African Americans. Um, and I think this sounds like we're going to take a systematic look at what can we do about it. 
And I think you've answered part of my question that the product of this process will be an action plan. Mm -hmm. so my question is, um, how, uh, what do you envision, and it may be too early to answer this, but what do you envision then being the, once we have the action plan, how are we going to pull people together to actually work to effectuate it. <laughs> and then my other question had to do with um, other parts of the county. Is this primarily, this effort primarily focused on Columbia or is there any aspect of it that's gonna focus on the other parts of the county? So that's the easier question. Your second question is the easier question. Um, it, is, it is for the entire county and, um, you know, there are different issues and, and it's it's interesting when Urban Institute actually kind of says, well, it's communities. Well, um, we have different issues that are um, are acting on communities within our counties, right? So so it's not just one size fits all in Columbia and in Centralia and in Harrisburg and Hallsville and Ashland. It's not one size fits all. So so this has to take that into account. Um, and um, Cradle to Career, when it began, I think was was partially focused on Columbia, but this, at the same time, it when it became the Cradle to Career Alliance, it that reflected that whole notion of this is uh, many communities, one county. This is Boone County, and so we are looking at um, at utilizing this process across the county. So that's that's that question. The, the first question, you know, um, it's, that's the difficult part, holding, holding each other accountable, right? And saying, and saying, Carl saying to me, Carl as the city of Columbia saying to me as the county of Boone, um, you're, here's your obligation, here's what you agreed to do. Are you, are you meeting your obligation? or Janet, you're not meeting your obligation. And so part of that, I think is, you know, we're gonna to have to work through that to say, to make sure that we hold each other's feet to the fire. That, um, and it's not just, cause when Carl and I are no longer in our respective roles, our organizations still have to um, have bought into this and said, yes, this is part of who we are and this is our commitment to our community. So, um, what that looks like is, um, you know, is, is part of the making the sausage, but as, as CJ Dykhouse would say, but I think that's a big piece of it is because it has to, it has to last longer than um, the two of us, Carl, Carl and me in, in office, it has to, it has to continue because this is not a, um, a one shot over the bows and it's done, right? I mean, these problems have been in, in place for a for generations, and sometimes it's going to take a it's going to take a lot of work to overcome something that has has been built up for generations. Janet, I realize the process is just beginning, but mm -hmm. so at this point, it's obvious way too early to to do give any specifics of what will happen or even what might happen. But do you have any kind of examples of what sort of things this this money can be used for or things that, that you see maybe coming down the road? So the the money that we got from Urban Institute is not that great. And it's not what's going to um, be allocated for the change. The money from Urban Institute is essentially helping us pay um, salaries for folks who are doing the data collection, who are doing the data analysis, who are doing all that kind of stuff. So it's, and, and it's also helping us to um, pay people, quite honestly, who are going out in the field and collecting data, because we can't expect people just to give their time, right? So it's, it's being used to gather the information now so that we can have all of that in one place and then create that plan. So it's, you know, this is, um, I keep thinking everything happens for a reason and maybe it happens at the, the right time for the right reason. And maybe, maybe some of this is ARPA. Maybe this is something that Carl and I can talk to our colleagues about and say, 
what is what does this look like? How do, how do we look at some of the ARPA funding to create a center as as Speaker Pelosi talked about? You know that um, that transformative change. Because if we if we believe in this as a community, then how do we create this? And and is this something that we can um, that if we can allocate it now and get it going, is that something that we could do with ARPA funding? I don't know. I mean, I think that's those are those are the questions you know for both the um, that piece of legislation, but also for going forward is what kind of money are we willing to do? Because it's it's so many things. Like I said, as going through the metrics, you know, you have housing insecurity. Um, is is some I mean that's that's a huge piece of, of all of this is housing insecurity if, if you don't have a place to rest your head if you're couch surfing if you are you know whatever whatever level of housing insecurity there is that's something that impacts so much of our community right and so that may be a piece that's that as the people are looking at it that may be a piece that really rises to the top of all of this um, and tied to that is in terms of, um, of barriers that have been created over time, over generations in our community and so many other communities is um, it is so um, it is so much more likely that a um, a white family is going to be um, in a position of having home ownership and a black family is not. You know, so is is that something where you know where you don't have that cap that capital that access to those kinds of resources? So it it, it it'll depend on what the data shows, but I think you know housing is a huge piece of it. Transportation is a huge piece of it. Access to early childhood education, quality early childhood quality, affordable early childhood education. Those are things that um, are clearly part of what. Urban Institute has looked at as barriers and opportunities. And so those those may be places where the folks look at and say, gosh, that's where that's where we need to put some of our efforts. They're probably not asking me, but that's that's what I'm thinking. Al Plummer said his hand up for considerable oh, period of time. I'm sorry. Oh, Al. Thank you. Hello, Janet. Hey, how are you, my friend? I am fine, my friend. I cannot uh, commend you enough and express how fortunate we are to have someone with your level of compassion representing us and providing leadership. Um, the The items you mentioned are the are the obvious, and maybe my question goes deeper and beyond the initial scratching of the surface, which are the material things, the housing insecurity, uh, finances, income, all of those are, are kind of obvious. I'm wondering though, if, um, uh, if our data is going to uh, look at the psychological locks on poverty. Um, we can resolve, we, let's say we resolve the materialistic things, but there's still a psychological lock uh, that comes with um, years and oftentimes generations of poverty uh, that, uh, that, is, that still prohibits uh, the success of an individual who may rise shortly out of the materialistic problems, but their mindset still doesn't allow them to uh, continue to rise to the surface. So I guess my question is whether or not those, uh, the psychological impact will be considered. Um, I've just written down what you've said and uh expect a phone call <laughs> oh <laughs> that wasn't the nature of I my know, question <laughs> i know i know but i but it's those kinds of things that i think this is you know the the event on the 11th 
Um, and and the discussions moving forward, I think those are those are key to saying what are, what are the barriers? Because I, because what Urban has been really very clear about is um, it's local. It's it's what is local that's going to drive this. And there may be things, and what you're talking about may be something that is much broader, but it certainly may be very, it may have a huge impact locally. So I'm going to send this to Joanne Nelson and I'm gonna say, um, Al Plummer might, might have, a, if I've not written it down right, here's Al Plummer's information. So, um, you know, I, the, it's those kinds of questions because because you could I mean just your your analysis just now makes you may I'm sure makes everybody here start thinking. Um, well, like, what, uh, what kind of barrier is that, and then how do you address it, right? Yeah, and it comes from a very personal experience. So um, because I was one of those folks who grew up in poverty, I. I did uh, five elementary schools before reaching sixth grade. Wow. Uh, so yeah, I do understand some of the issues related to that. Well, and, and, and I appreciate that, but I think, and I think it's so important for us to have these conversations to make sure that we're not missing something. And, and, it's, and part of what I think is important about how this is really set up, and again, it's Steve Calloway's voice, and I'm, sorry, I'm I'm outing you, Steve. It's Steve Calloway's voice in my head that says, "Make sure you're not acting on. Make sure you're listening to and engaging the people, rather than you know acting top down." Um, and and that's part of how this um, Urban Institute is set up. That's how this process is set up, so that we don't have that you know, top down kind of thing, but listen to people and really make sure that um, that an, an outsider's perspective isn't right. And Steve's written nothing about us without us. I mean, that's critical, right? It has to have that perspective that drives what we do. Um, so, you know, that's, again, that's how Urban Institute has this process um, sort of planned, and then they, they're they hoping that they can help us effectuate that. So that's huge. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Steve. And um, I'm going to make sure Joanne gets that and make sure that's part of the process. Okay, it awesome. looks like Carl's had his hand up for a while, and then Herb is next. Thank you. Um, well, all I can say is thank you, Janet, for doing this. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Darren Priest. Thanks a lot of people uh, for, for working on this issue. I mean, your association with NACO is kind of equivalent to my association with the National League of Cities, which is involved in these kinds of things as well. Yep. And I don't, you know, I, I, I certainly am totally sympathetic to the idea uh, that Steve's idea that we ought to work from the bottom up. Uh, but <laughs> there is a but there. Um, that presumes that we have the capacity uh, to, uh, to really contact the folks to be able to participate, to be even invited to the table or identify them, um, to, to have these folks sit at the table so that we can proceed from the bottom up. Sometimes that's not possible. And elected leadership, as you well know, is a function of uh, both leadership and, and representation. And I, even your meeting in a week and a half is probably an example of as many folks as we can invite is going to be kind of a top down thing to set agenda, set the strategic agenda so that we can, that work product so that we can get to the point where to deliver stuff. And we should have seen this coming, and I'm sure you did, a long time ago when we just look, took a look at the student lunches in our high schools in, in, in the city of Columbia. I mean, this has been coming for a long, long time with all of the relative prosperity that Columbia has had and some in Boone County. Um, uh, it's also a, a heartbreaking to see what's been going on. It's a generational thing. We've lost generations here as well. So I just, you know, and, and all do apologies to Steve with his emphasis on the bottom up stuff. And I appreciate that I'm totally on board and I think that's what we need to do. 
Um, but uh, it's, just, it's, it's hard, it's, it's devilishly hard work. The city has some ideas about this. We have occasionally done some things to invite folks and have a meal and have, have childcare and so on. And, and new leadership emerged and they, and they continue to show up at city council meetings. That's the kind of thing that we need to do because we need to take this on the road to some degree, as difficult as that is. Yep, exactly. And it is, it is harder. Um, and, and that's, I think that that was Steve's point to me a few months back is that it's harder to do it that way. Um, and so part of what, you know, we are so blessed with in this community, having groups like the Worley Street Roundtable to help us engage folks and, and really hear those voices and make sure those voices are the primary voices at the table. And, and so, and we act more as scribes rather than the ones talking. So, um, you know, this is, it's been great to, to engage in that process and start that whole process. And with Steve's, um, Steve's leadership, Verna LaBoy's leadership to find those voices to, you know, to celebrate those voices. I think that's really critical. And, um, and it's really been helpful, again, to build on what we've done in the past. Uh, Crystal, and you, you all may know her as Crystal Croner, Crystal Newsom. Um, now, she, uh, so Crystal has been a, um, such a great person to work with because she and Joanne Nelson have worked through that, um, that Pritzker Foundation grant that we had, the prenatal to three, which was looking at um, the home visiting program and getting that, those, establishing relationships with folks who may be the same, who may be some of the same people we'll hear from in this process. I think at least there's the groundwork laid for some of those um, those opportunities to hear voices that normally are not heard, but it is hard work, Carl. Oh gosh, it is hard work, and um, and we are we are blessed to have a group of people. You know, the folks who who came who who answered the call when I said, "Hey guys, would you be willing?" And I scared the pants off the first group because I said. Um, I, I didn't tell them when they first met what the deadline was. And then I told them that it was um, two days from when I had convened them. And I told them that I needed the draft um, the next morning and they all stroked. And then I said, well, doesn't, you know, it, we met on a Monday and I, and I said, I, when do you, they said, when do you need it? And I said, I need it tomorrow morning. And I heard these gasps. And then I said, well, now doesn't Wednesday morning sound that much better? So <laughs> this is a group of people who have been wonderful and they are so um, engaged and, and working with the community. So I'm just, I'm excited about it. I think it, it's, it's a lot of work, but dear sweet heaven, we have an opportunity. So, and I think Herb, you were next and you're muted Herb. Can't hear you. Don't. There, there, you go. there you go. Thank you, Janet, for taking leadership in this area. Um, I am glad that you, you are at Boone County and Columbia are among the gang of eight initial cases. <laughs> You're highlighting the conundrum of Boone County as a place with obvious advantages, but at the same time, upward social and economic mobility from those who are less advantaged is miserable. It is worse than that. It's also true of Washington, Philadelphia, Riverside, and a couple of the others that I know something about. So you have, if, if this is the, a group of communities with that common conundrum, which has been argued about as to cause and remedy based on anecdotal data, unproductive argument for decades and decades, including all my life since I was born and brought up in Washington. How are you going to take advantage of the data emphasis here? Will you systematically, systematically collect data among yourselves 
for comparison among yourselves by systematical analytical methods that might help to sort out the factors that are most appropriate for emphasis on some basis other than anecdotal argument. And, and that's what um, really is the genius about this process because we have Urban Institute and, and this is all funded through the Gates Foundation, but it's the Urban Institute folks that are guiding each of the members of the cohort of this gang of eight. And they are in turn um, bringing, taking it back up one step. We are, we are not just meeting as Boone County, but we are also meeting with the other members of the cohort. So we are sharing data as we're moving forward, but then it's going up to urban so that we get their, um, their ability, ability to analyze the data to help us because they're, you know, their goal is not to say, gosh, Boone County has, you know, has checked all the boxes and moving forward, but it's how, you know, if we can move this thing forward, how can we have a game plan, a something to, to help other communities? Because it has to not stop here. You know, if, if we succeed, then what what does success look like? How can how can we help other communities make that same transformative change? And I think that's the critical piece to your to your point, Herb. It's like it's not enough. It, it's huge if we can if we get there, but we have to be able to say to to Urban Institute and to Gates Foundation, yes, there actually is an answer. There is a way forward. And so I think that's that's huge. Hi, Sue, yeah. We may, we may be in an unusual position as our county, not only by size, but I'm not sure any of the other of them have an Amish community in it. And I think that studying people, they are on, on economic factors are very low, I would believe, on how much funds they have but they share because kind of what I'm hearing is in many um, in more impoverished area, the problem is if you have some kind, of, one of the problems that happens is if you have some kind of emergency, how do you get at funds without going to a payday loan? Mm -hmm. And they serve as that. <laughs> so I'm thinking that you may have a dimension, be able to have it call on a dimension. Mm -hmm. It gives another sample because that's also what some of the, like Oxfam and some other groups are doing internationally, especially among women, because I think also it's harder to get at women impoverished and how to help them because so much is related to men's organization and just the problem in general. Mm -hmm. So I, I see two things there that, um, may make it that the, yeah. the, the urban, that the, the um, or, organizations may be very happy they picked Boone County if you also try to stress some of that. Um, I, will, I will certainly, that'll be another thing for Joanne. You and Al are both on the list for Joanne Nelson, sorry. <laughs> Tag, you're it. <laughs> Wanna call on Mari? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, but kind of going back to the conversation about how to get people whose voices need to be heard, how to get them heard. Um, there was a process involved in a community health improvement planning where there were, I think, three, three specific census tracts in the city of Columbia that were selected for an effort to collect information yeah. about barriers that people were facing. And I'm just pointing this out that the Worley Street Roundtable is absolutely wonderful. Um, but that's kind of based in and focused on the first ward. Right. And most of the people in poverty in Columbia live in the second and third wards. Right. It's much harder to reach. Right. But we don't have organizations like that. So I'm suggesting you might want to go back and look at the data that was collected through that previous process. Gotcha. It was very intentional. It was very, there were consultants who came in and 
ran the meetings. And as Carl said, they provided meals and childcare so that we did get some pretty broad based community. So I just don't want to lose that information that might contribute to this process. It was just like a few years ago, but not a long time. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, it was, then, it was frankly, it was, that was one of the reasons why it led to the dismissal of the city manager because that program was canceled in, 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 in appreciation for the fact that most people wanted to deal with community policing citywide rather than on these pilot projects. But the data that was collected was, in, was very valuable and emergent leadership was significant. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to just point out that the, um, there's some conversation going on in the chat as in terms of the political risk. David Robinson posted, you know, this, um, what's going to happen in, in Jefferson City in response to this, that there may be negative <laughs> uh, response. And then, um, it, yeah, oh, yeah. Let's. So just want to draw your attention to the chat. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I was just going to call on Kathy Jensen. Yes, um, I'm very glad that the community, uh, the Central Missouri Community Action Agency is involved because they have, uh, with the Head Start program, an excellent model for working with um, and communicating with and involving the families who are experiencing poverty. And I think that, you know, that they, they have a lot of contacts that will be very valuable. Now, they have an eight county service area so that I know uh, they may not serve as, they, their services may be in terms of Head Start primarily in, in Columbia, but as far as that part goes, but, but they, they have some excellent models. And the reason I know that is that I worked for the Head Start program for a long time. And we involved parents of Head Start children as the, the third teacher in the classroom and as, a, as volunteers in other ways. And we, we developed a model that worked very well to involve people. And I think that, that that's a, a really important um, resource to be tapped. The other thing that I don't believe that I heard anything about was the impact of systemic racism. Mm -hmm. You know, you spoke about the fact that um, African Americans are not as likely to own homes as white people. And that is directly because of systemic racism. And I think that um, that has to be addressed. Um, a, a book that I would recommend to all of you to read to, that is very eye-opening is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And it describes very clearly how racism has been built into so many of the structures and institutions and systems in our country. And I think, um, and the, they, they've been there a long time and they're coming right down to this day. And I think we have to acknowledge that and look seriously at it. And, and to your point, thank you so much. To your point, um, part of the, um, the initial documents and ongoing discussion through Urban Institute has been um, the, the piece um, about systemic racism and looking at it so it's not, um, a lot of it is the structural structural racism within a community that leads to um, these kinds of results. So it it I mean it's it's all part and parcel of of this discussion. You bet. Thank you and and thank you for your service on, for Head Start because um, that's a that's a big piece of it. You know and and again coming back to some of the folks that are involved and and this isn't you know. A lot of times when you talk about programs like this, it's only social services agencies that are involved. You know, you just see the folks on that side of this of the street. But this um, this grant opportunity, when it came to us, one of the first phone calls I made was to um, Ready, because you know Matt Jenny over at Ready and Stacy Button, and they said. We're, we're in, 
we're in this because we understand how important this is. So having that kind of broad community support for this um, is huge. And when I think about Ready and the, and the Chambers of Commerce in here in Boone County, we may be very different from a lot of this state. We I think we are very aligned with the um, the U.S. Count, um, Chamber of Commerce because when the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, some of their core initiatives are um, access to affordable early childhood education. That's huge for them. And also for transportation, huge. So those are things that our local folks understand and having, having the, the chamber and having ready part of this discussion, I think will, will help us as we move forward to say what's, what's important, what, what kinds of change need to happen in order to get to um, the end game. So I see it's 112, I don't know if, um, if I would love to talk, I could talk about this forever. Um, and, and number one, I really appreciate every, everybody saying nice things about me, but um, I'm just, somebody the other day said, you're part bulldog and part terrier. Um, pretty much I get hold of somebody's pant leg and I don't let go. Or like Carl knows, I call and, um, and I don't take no, or I keep calling until just force of habit you pick up the phone. So that's, that's essentially how this thing got started. But, you know, where we're going really depends on and is a, is a tribute to people like Steve Calloway, like um, Darren Priest, like Stacy Button, like Joanne Nelson, um, like Crystal, like all of these people who see how important this is and are um, dedicated to making it work, dedicated to making this systemic, this transformative change. So I'm just the 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 mutt dog, um, or as my cousin would say, the cur dog that has hold of somebody's pant leg and won't let go. So there you go. And I, I want to thank you for being here with us today. Appreciate you sharing this information with us. So I, I'm going to, as you pointed out, it's big time for our meeting to be over. So I'm going to officially bring it to a close, but if uh, Janet wants to stick around, if y'all want to stick around and chat with her, that I uh, think sounds like she has some time. So if you want to continue to chat, I'm going to have to drop off, going to head out somewhere, but I hope you can all be back with us next week. Brian, Major Columbia Mayor Brian Trees will be here. It sounds like he's going to be presenting what I would call a, a state of the city address almost and kind of fill us in on how things have been going. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. And Janet, again, thank you for so much for being here. Thank all of y'all. I'll everybody. see you all next week. Lovely to see you. Janet, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for being Be well. Stay safe, folks. And stay cool. Be well. <laughs> Janet, is United Way in with the, with this? Yes, they are. Okay. I, I, yep. I, yep. They're also part of it. Okay. It, Janet, I have I have two yeah. concerns that I uh, I'm sure have been addressed already. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. One, I didn't hear seniors mentioned anywhere in terms of, of this. Are they just not part of it or um, are they uh, being included? Um, I will I will ask, you know, I think the, the focus, the express focus that I've heard has been more on um, families with children, but I, but um, I will, I will make sure that that's, um, that that question. Well, I bring that up and I have a second question too. Um, oh, I think when you talk about early childhood, you are talking about some of the most visible programs. You're talking about Head Start, which of course, uh, your good grant writer, uh, is director of too. Um, and, but I think it's really important to include the elements of early childhood that are not, um, either well-known, good PR, center-based, uh -huh. or um, a head start, because there's there are a lot of family talker providers in the community. They're more than, uh, they're, they're just, you'll be surprised how many, I don't have the exact number. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Um, th that ties very strongly to economics for those families as well. And some of those are high quality and some of them are abysmal to use right. the word. Um, yeah. But there are programs and have been programs in the community that have brought those up, um, but have been discontinued for whatever political reasons in the past by I'm thinking of Educare. Uh, some are still in operation like Lyndon Learn, 
Um, but you know, you don't, they're not the ones sitting in on these meetings because they're, they're not doing the PR that some of the groups are doing. Well, and I just think that's real important to include them. And, and, and to your point, I, to me, one of the things that when I was at this U.S. Chamber meeting um, a couple years ago in Atlanta, and it was all it was really all about early early childhood education. And one of the things that every speaker there said is to remember that um, when you say quality, sometimes quality implies organizational, right? It, it, that kind of that um, that brand name, but quality can just as easily be grandma. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's the it's what's being provided, and don't be afraid of of the mechanism by which it's provided, right? And don't and don't denigrate something that it's grandma, because mm -hmm. grandma may be a really great way of delivery of service depending on the circumstances depending on grandma's ability but depending on the circumstances and it it has economic connotations it has all of that so to your point it's it's not you know um head start is a great model but there may be others there and i think what we're looking at in this process is saying um you know what is it that you want delivered to the kiddos? And, and there's different ways of providing it depending on the circumstances. Well, I think I think Lend and Learn is a good example. It's not a place a lot of people have heard about even, but there are a lot of grandmas that go there and they get support yeah. for themselves and the kids yeah. at the same yeah. time. And exactly. those kinds of things need to really be promoted. And yeah. I've worked well, for Head Start and they're great. And I've worked for a lot of uh, nonprofits, yeah. so. Well, but thank you, because that's a, a, an excellent point. Thank you. Well, and I hate to say this, but I need to scoot. Um, and um, yeah, it's, but this is great. This is great to see all of you all. So I need to, I, I need to head out the door, but um, you, you know, if you have any ideas or anything that, that you think might be at least, you know, ideas that need to be explored, some other, other thing that needs to be explored my email is jthompson at boonecountymo.org. And I'll put it, let's see if I can do this. Um, let me see if I can put it in the chat. I'll put it to everyone. Um, so that's my email. And so please um, reach out and I will also um, 